Welcome everybody to Doc NYC's inaugural Spring Showcase. This is our mid-year celebration of documentary films and series. I'm Karen McMullen. I'm a feature um, programmer at Doc NYC, and it's my pleasure to be speaking with Asif Kapadia, James Gay Reese, Chris King, Danielle Peck, and James Rogan, the filmmaking team behind Apple TV Plus's 1971, The Year Music Changed Everything. Welcome everyone. Hi. Hi. So great to, uh, this is one of the benefits of Zoom is that you can have everybody together. You know, um, it's great to have the whole team here. I loved your series. I stayed up way too late watching it. Um, it was a trip down memory lane and it was also super informative at the same time. So thank you for this really amazing film. Great. Series. Yeah. Um, so let's jump in. There's lots to talk about. Um, so in the film, our wonderful Jimmy Yovin, the record executive, said that music wasn't a reflection of the times, but it caused the times. And I'm wondering that, you know, these days people consume music in these personally curated ways. You know, everybody has their own Spotify playlist. Do you think, given how we're, we're consuming music now, that music would have the ability to have the same generation influencing effect as it did in 1971. I mean, I'll start, but I mean, you know, I'm sure, you know, the others will have a point of view on this as well. I mean, I think, um, I mean, we get asked this question a lot on this show because it's just, it's so symptomatic of how much the world has changed that in 1971, these album releases would be such big news, you know, and there would be a cultural moment when an album came out like this. And it would basically, you know, the point of the series is to understand how the music influenced the time and how the time influenced the music in a much more direct way, perhaps, than we get today. Because today, obviously, everything is so fractured and there's such a competition for people's attention spans, which is, you know, getting shorter and shorter, all these different stimulations coming in from different directions. So, I mean, you know, it's a really interesting question as to whether, you know, was that, you know, just a moment in time and can it be replicated? Can we get back to a time where music has that? sort of impact on the sort of overall conversation in society. And it would be great to think that that was possible again, because when music is as potent as it can be, as some of the music in our series is, you know, when Marvin Gaye drops uh, what's going on, you know, it has a really tangible effect on society. Um, and that's obviously what, that was the intention, right? That he wanted, so that was his intention. So it'd be lovely to think that music could have that impact again. Doesn't feel like it's happening anytime soon in that direct way, but um, I don't think it's impossible. I also think that for a, a lot of people, anyone aged under 30 in 1971, music was actually the primary way to get news as well. They ignored the mainstream media. They didn't trust the, the news stations or the newspapers. That was for squares. They really, they waited for these releases and they heard their lives being echoed in these songs being described and events that perhaps they didn't know about being written about in My Lai or in Vietnam, other places in Vietnam or in civil rights activities that were taking place throughout America. And they got not just musical pleasure, but actually direct information and calls to action in this music as well in a way which I don't think is possible today uh, uh, because it doesn't exist in the same framework. Music was the predominant culture for young people. Uh, that's where they got everything from. Nowadays, it's also fractured and everyone's on their devices and you've got a million sources of information and social media and everything. So I don't think music quite holds that enormous weight of influence that it did back then at the beginning of the 70s. I think modern technology and the way we consume it nowadays makes a massive difference. I mean, we are so used to being surrounded by music everywhere we go, you know, we take it with us, we hear it wherever we go. But in, in 71, it was much more ritualistic, you know, the, the, the new albums and you, you know, the, all the art, album art and the album notes and it's, it's, um, it was a real event. Whereas music now just pops up wherever we are and it's less, it lands less communally um, because it is everywhere and so easy to consume. So I, I don't think, especially during pandemic when we don't have those unifying concerts where you feel that com commonality, um, it's, 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 it's very different nowadays. Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, let's let's talk about the structure of your film. It's such a, a great looking film, um, evocative, you know, visually of the the seventies. And um, what I specifically appreciated was this deliberate choice, obviously, not to use talking heads, but to mine the archival footage to have people tell the stories. Can you talk about the how that decision came about? James Asif, do you want to? Asif, do you want to go for that? Yeah, I mean, I, I can say something. I mean, it's kind of been a stylistic thing that we as a kind of team and as a production company have been doing for a few years now with a series of films, um, which I suppose the closest one to the series is Amy, you know, the idea of a musician um, and where all of our characters that we've made previously, where they sit in time, the location, the landscape, the, the what's going on in the world around them. Um, but with Amy specifically, kind of the using of um, lyrics on screen in order, you may know the songs, you may have had these records for 40 years, 50 years, but actually, what, did you really understand what they were about? So the lyrics play an interesting part in the series here. Um, an archive is just something that we've, um, Chris said, has been working with us for so many films now where we work really hard with a team of researchers to keep searching, keep searching to find the material that can tell the story visually for you to feel like you're in the present, you're there at the time and not constantly cutting backwards and forwards from an interview now and someone describes something and then you show a little bit and you come back to now. There's something about being lost in the period of 1971, which I think is what is so powerful about the series is that you're there, you're there for every single app. And then you have all these different storylines that cross over and characters that maybe appear in one episode and then appear in another. And it just feels incredibly real and authentic. And it all becomes part of the kind of, policy of if you trust the archive it can take you there in a way visually and emotionally that I think no talking head for me will ever do the same and I think there's a lot of existing musical programming on tv stations where there are older artists looking back on an album you know how they made a particular album or whatever and they're inevitably nostalgic and we definitely definitely wanted to avoid this being a nostalgia exercise we wanted a young audience to come and live through these events and feel how tangibly alike they were to their lives now. There are so many similarities and so many themes and issues which are still unresolved today that we didn't want it to just be much older people looking back, but for anybody to be able to come into this and join these stories and feel what it was like and understand why people were writing about it and, uh, and making music out of it and, and why people were listening to that music and spurred into action, for instance. Um, and so that decision, as Asif said, to just keep it in the moment, to keep it contemporaneous and never break away from that, I think is a good one. And there's enough material and music. I mean, you've got all these other elements. If you had Talking Heads in there as well, it would be overwhelming, I think. You know, I don't think there was much to be gained from seeing anybody now. I think there's also the advantage that a lot of the artists are no longer with us, like David Bowie, we could really weave in to the films without feeling that he was no longer here today because we were back in that time and weaving the people who are still alive in with that time made it really seamless. So there was no difference between the people still with us and, and those who have passed since 71. Yeah, I, I would also add that, I mean, sort of picking up on what, what Asif said, I think with Senna and Amy, the you know documentary changed somewhat, and you know the last ten years, you know documentaries have moved away from being about things to being about the experience of things. And the thing for us, as we were making this, was how do you make people feel it? You know, like how do you feel like you're in the moment? How do you live this music again? How do you live it in the context that the artist wrote it? How do we get excited and passionate about it? We don't want to explain how a song was written. We want to show how a song was written. We want to show that, you know, if you were in Ohio, the response was to write Ohio. You know, if you were, if you were Neil, Neil Young at that moment, when the Kent State Massacre happened, you would want to pick up your guitar. You want to be immediate and access to what people were accessing and that felt like a different way to experience music that we knew really well already. So we know what's going on, but we didn't necessarily know the feeling and the context of the moment that it was written in. And that became really important to us. And then the influence between the artists of John Lennon listening to what's going on and then how he felt and what he expressed musically. So it was, it was all about creating the present tense. 
Yeah, it, it really does. It did have the effect of uh, giving a sense of urgency or immediacy to have, you know, not have that. So that was that was a wonderful choice. And the words on the screen, um, you know, show the poetry of what these people were saying, you know. Um, and it also had the benefit of letting people like me who've been singing the wrong words for 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's what Marvin was saying. Yeah. Um, Yes. Yeah, so yeah, that... yeah, the other thing I would add is that it was, you know, is that it's easy to think of 71 as the past, but it wasn't the past for us when we were making it. We were completely immersed in it, and every moment in the series felt like it was saying something about today. And obviously, I wasn't born in 71, but I grew up with the music because all the, all the tracks, not all of them, but the most of them are very well known. And, and that experience of suddenly being immersed in them and seeing that they were speaking to the same things in, to people at the time as they're speaking to today, and also as I was growing up, was a really vital experience. So in the edit, we were having this very sort of exciting kind of time of just getting fully immersed in the music, but actually sort of feeling like you could live it as well as listen to it. Well, you all obviously have... Um some magic together as a filmmaking team. You've had a lot of success with Amy and Senna and, and other, other projects. Can you talk about how you came together and uh, what your work process is? Uh, it's a long history. So um, Asif and I, with Chris, made Senna, first of all. I knew Asif from um, the commercials world a long time ago. And Chris and I also worked on the film, well, back to, Chris basically worked on the Banksy film, except for the gift shop, and I came onto that later, all around the same time as Senna, basically. Um, so that was a kind of, you know, it was funny, actually, I was telling somebody about it earlier today, you know, when we made those films, I mean, feature documentary was still a relatively unknown form, you know, there'd been some, obviously a few big films like Touch in the Void and, you know, um, when we were kids, but they were, they were the, ex the exception, not the rule in those days, those sort of big feature docs. And then we came along just in the sort of second wave of those with those two films. And um, it sort of became a thing, didn't it? You know, and then that form became very sort of uh, popular. Um, and then it expanded into other forms of uh, some more long form documentary. But yeah, we just, you know, we just got into the groove of making these archive based films. Um, and that is funny because actually using all archive with no talking heads and no voiceover felt quite radical at the time. And there were people when we were making Senna that said it couldn't be done. You know, you have to have one or the other. The audience won't know what's going on but we obviously managed to pull it together on Senna um, and then enjoyed working that way. I mean, it's extremely, extremely labor intensive and expensive to do, to make documentaries that way because archive is expensive. Um, and the amount of editing time, even though Chris is a very quick editor, it still takes a long time to put these episodes together. But it's just, uh, yeah, it's a very, very hands-on process. And Asif can explain more about, you know, how that sort of style evolved because it, I don't think he refers to it as like a large mosaic because you've got no shortcuts. The, the picture's got to do all the work. So you've got to find the right pictures to, in order to carry the narrative through. Yeah, I, what I would say was it was, it did feel like we were pushing the boundaries in a way with Senna. You know, that was the first one, which um, so many people just thought they didn't get it. They didn't understand what, what, what are you actually doing? How is that filmmaking? You know, it's just editing, isn't it? And it's like, well, it is, but it's also, you know, there are lots of things happening at the same time. There's a lot of research, a lot of, detailed research, meeting everyone who's there in the room. I think that was part of it. Who was there? It's not just getting an opinion of random famous people who have an opinion of a particular event. It's like, no, who was there? Let's talk to them. At the same time as doing that, so we started doing interviews and audio interviews. And at the same time as that, we've got a brilliant team of archive researchers searching for all of the material of the period and the time. And the search has to be as wide as possible. And then generally we were editing as we're doing the research, as we're doing the interview. So all of this is happening at the same time. I come from a fiction background. So it was a kind of opposite of drama. You, you are creating a story as you always do with the documentary, I suppose, in the edit, but it, the, you're rewriting it constantly, constantly and interviewing people. So I think it was just that moment of being brave and saying, we're not going to do this interview on camera. A lot of the time, as James mentioned earlier, we've made lots of films about people who are not around. So I want people to forget that that person's not around when they're watching it. I want them to believe they're alive. And I think that's continued with the series. You want to feel John Lennon's still in the room and you're listening to them. You want to feel Bowie's still there talking. And you don't want to keep reminding them that they're not, you know. And that's why there's somehow that idea of believing it and trusting 
trusting the process, trusting the research, trusting the fact that we'll find something that will plug that narrative hole if we just keep searching and talking to people, or you have to rewrite the story to fit what you do find. That's all part of the kind of process and, and, and the team. And once everyone bought into it, I think we've done a, quite a few things. And in many ways, you know, the industry has had to change to kind of come in alignment with what we've been doing. I think there's also a big element, which is quite good fun, but can be frustrating, of kind of, it's like a cold case of detective work that goes on that you go and speak to somebody in an interview, as if we come back having spoken to somebody and say, he referred to this, I don't, and I don't know what that means. So we'd send a researcher out and they would find out and come back. And all of a sudden we may unearth something that took the story in a completely new direction and have, we've got to find these people because these people seem like they're important to the story. So let's mm -hmm. find them. And then lo and behold, one of them might say, oh, I've, I have a bit of archive that I've always had of that. And so, sequences would suddenly become really important that we hadn't even considered previously um and obviously it's enormously frustrating for a producer to have to tolerate that process because it is expensive as james says and and all of a sudden when you think you're going in one direction you veer off in another direction and perhaps that runs cold as well and you have to go back to the original thing but it's a very organic and, and exciting way of making films and, and documentaries i think um, 1971 though is, is even well, is, is different because it's not one narrative arc. You know, it's not Amy's story, it's not Senna's story. It's, it's a bunch of ideas and, and events and music that emerged in a very special year. So how do you craft that? Because there's no one narrative arc holding it all together. There are some very awkward junctions in terms of storytelling because you've got these multiple threads of storylines constantly weaving in and out. So how do you bring them back in when you don't have a narrator saying, and over on the other side of the planet, this was going on. Um, and that took incredibly talented editors <laughs> finessing these junctions, um, which I think were possibly, I mean, Chris, you speak for this, possibly the hardest thing in the whole thing. I mean, sometimes scenes were difficult because the material was very sparse, but it was making it work together as a whole for eight films. I mean, that's that was really challenging. Yeah, and I mean, I think, obviously you're making a story of a single year and there would be a temptation to just do that chronologically. and quite a lot of the stuff that was happening was fabulous because on single days, you would have Carol King walking into one studio and simultaneously David Bowie's walking into another studio and simultaneously John Lennon's going to another studio and they're all recording classic songs that we still hear and revere today. But it would end up being really kaleidoscopic if you just followed actual chronology of what's going on. So Danielle was very, very instrumental in, in carving a way for us to actually turn this into something that could stretch out comfortably over eight episodes. And, and, and identifying themes and trends aligned to certain performers uh, so that you could start stories running and quite comfortably pause that, introduce new characters, and then come back to those characters. It's a bit like Shortcuts in a way, the Altman film, where you, you never feel like you're too far away from any one character or any one storyline that you've completely forgotten what was going on. And because of that, it meant we could flip quite easily between different types of music because they were all united by these themes that Danielle had very cleverly identified, um, which dominated each or, or pairs of the episodes. Um, and, uh, and James, I think you were you kind of, you inherited the biggest and meatiest of those in some ways, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, I think it, it's it's sort of the way that I see these these films is that you're joining the dots, and each dot that you join adds another layer of meaning, and everything relates to everything else. So so the you know it's it's an unusual it wasn't there wasn't an obvious model for this. So the, the style as as we've discussed came from from Senna and Amy and. And I think, it, and and you know, James and Aspen, Chris have really sort of set the bar in terms of the films they they made. But to have multiple characters, multiple events, multiple locations, without the usual sort of signposting, was at a, at a craft level mind blowingly scary. At a, lo a lot of the time, I mean, there was a lot. Of, oh, there were many, many meetings where we sort of looked at each other with big goggle eyes and thought, is it, is it possible to, to kind of pull off all these narratives in a way that's satisfying? But the fundamentals were the, 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 the musicians' stories were always in relation to the 
to the political and social backdrop. And so finding the balance between how much Nixon versus how much John Lennon, you know, took, took a while, but once it sort of started to gel, it was really exciting because there was something really exciting about the fact that John Lennon's recording in his mansion in Ascot in the UK and Nixon's installing a recording system in the Oval Office at the same time. And they're both talking about the war. So, so there were, you know, there were these kind of parallel narratives that just kind of began to emerge throughout, throughout the series. And as those began to work, and it took a lot of time, it got very exciting. And then, and then it just sort of emerged from there. But it was, it was definitely at a craft level. And, and, and I mean, full credit to the editors, you know, Chris, Chris is sort of the lead editor, but there's also Brett Irwin and Simon Barker and Esther Jimenez and Sam Blair. And I mean, just an absolutely astonishing uh, editing job. Yeah, Absolutely. I mean, I think, sorry, I just need to say this because Chris and, and all the editors were so fundamental to this. It's, I've never worked with editors in this way before. And the most satisfying thing is when all these threads, all these kind of horses that you've led off on the chase, they all come together, they meld together with the perfect track. Mm. You know, then, then you know, I, I describe it as alchemy because, you know, I might have planned stuff, but not that kind of stuff. That just that just comes together because of painstaking work. The editors grafting through hours and hours and hours of archive and then, you know, working about music. And one my favorite scene uh, is in film six, I think now or five. Sorry, I can't remember the um, evil track. So Stevie Wonder. You know, there's a scene where we've we've been talking about Me Lai, we've been talking about Charles Manson because the seminal court cases happened that year, or, you know, they were sentenced that year. Um, there's there's a Stanford prison experiment, which is a really important psychological experiment showing about how, you know, ordinary people can be turned evil. And then, so this is a huge tapestry of imagery and thought underpinned by a killer track. And it's, it's just sublime. It's, yeah, there, there were great moments where, the music once again came to life in our hands and started having a conversation with the material. And that's something that actually, as Daniel says, there's a lot of unbelievable head scratching and day-to-day -day grinding out of, of how to basically construct things. But then the music would suddenly unite things and begin conversations. And you'd realize that in order, the grammar of these things, in order to go from A to B, you sometimes you can go via F, which is just a piece of music, which links those things together and unites. The music would, you know, maybe completely different and people's, but people's stories beneath the songs were identical. And only the piece of music that was relevant would ever reveal that, you know, Sly Stone and the Rolling Stones seem like absolutely dichotomies. And yet a single Sly Stone track took you from, a, you know, a mansion house in Bel Air um, the attic of a mansion house with a big pile of cocaine on the table in front of him to a basement in a, um, a, a villa in the south of France to where the Rolling Stones, both of them were doing exactly the same thing. And the music was the way to tell all that. And it was, a, it was lovely when you got those epiphanal moments that the music took off and did the job for you. Yeah, and the music that you, you tended to use was not the radio version. It were these, uh, you know, rarely heard, uh, versions of the song, which was really a treat um, and gave the film a freshness that was really appreciated. Mm. Um, so Apple is pretty new to this original content space and they came out strong with your series, which is really gonna be a destination um, series. Can you talk about how your collaboration came about with that company, with Apple? Yeah, we um we well we made this independently this series. So you know we we made it with some um, long term partners, um, the people over at Mercury Studios that we'd made Amy with beforehand. And um, so yeah, we uh we have an ongoing relationship with those guys. And then you know we we basically we flirted with making it with Apple a long time ago, and then we came back to um, Mercury, and it was just like you know very fortuitously you know just you know when we were close to finishing it, we started obviously. To, you know, showing it to a select bunch of people. And we were very lucky that Apple came on board and said they wanted to partner with us because, you know, on so many levels, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, yes, you know, they are relatively new as a platform, but they're, um, you know, when you have the might of, might of Apple behind you, it's very reassuring, you know, because obviously they're, they're so adept at so many aspects of the kind of, uh, of the technology and the kind of positioning and the marketing. 
So yeah, I mean, they're the ideal partner for it, to be honest with you. So we're super happy to be with these guys. Great. Um, and what's what is next for uh, for this team? Are you do you have another big project together? No, we're all sick of the sight of each other, and we're doing independent things for a while. <laughs> Two years. It's was they, no, God, I mean, this is this. We've been working on this literally from way. I mean, I think Danielle's been on this alone for way in excess of two years. Three years. Been, yeah, yeah. yeah. At least. Beast to uh, get off the ground, and you know, it was one of those projects, like somebody said earlier. You know, because obviously we had a we had a budget, which is you know, you never have quite enough budget, but we did have quite a lot of time. But it was, it did feel like it was the impossible job because you are talking about, you know, probably the biggest music catalog in the history of time, and you are talking about some of the most expensive and then rarest, you know, and hard to get archive because you're dealing with such massive acts. So it's a testament to the whole team that we actually managed to finish it at all, to be honest, because they were playing the songs and thinking, but this is just impossible. It's the impossible job, let alone the creative, you know, how are we going to actually make it? What are the themes going to be? It's also like, okay, well, how do we deliver it? So yeah, we're having a bit of a pause after a, you know, a very intense couple of years on that, but we're all doing different things at the moment, on, uh, inevitably. All right. Well, I know that uh, you know you had to purchase a lot of your archives. So there wasn't a whole lot that you were you were buying that didn't make it in. But there has to be a anecdote or two or a storyline or two that you all begrudgingly left on the cutting room floor. Do you care to share? Yeah, of course. I mean, so much. We left so much on the cutting room floor like so, so much I mean it was so it was so rich and I mean I could say that so there's a film about John John Lennon and the writing of Imagine and the writing of what's going on that's the, thir the first episode sort of captures the mood of protest that's sweeping the country and how some of the biggest musicians are responding to it and then another film that, that we made about the kind of the revolutionary moment that was happening that followed the Black Panthers and the Last Poets and Gil Scott Heron and Aretha Franklin um, uh, interacting with Angela, Angela Davis and, and, and offering to pay her bail. The, the murder of George, George Jackson and the Attica uprisings. So a good example of something that, that, that always broke my heart slightly that we couldn't, we didn't include is that immediately after the Attica uprising, the um, Aretha Franklin that Christmas played a benefit for the prisoners. And then, and this is a big scene in one of the episodes and it's, a, you know, it kind of captures her playing bridge over troubled water and it's significant for all sorts of reasons. And it's told to her by her drummer. But that night, she invited other people and John Lennon turned up with Yoko Ono to play a self penned song, Attica. And, uh, and we weren't able to kind of keep, keep, keep that in because it was just too complicated in, in, that, in that moment. And also Attica, you know, as a sort of a newspaper song after Aretha singing was just quite, you know, as Dan, Danielle put it, quite discordant. So, so there were <laughs> little, little details that, that sort of even enhanced your kind of understanding of just how closely everyone was working together and how tightly people were pulling together. And sometimes just making those narrative lines clear meant that you had to kind of, you know, sort of you'd be like, oh, we've got to mention that Lennon was there, but we just didn't quite have the ability to do it in that, in that moment. So yeah, the one, in one my one heart, I know he was there. And that was that I really, really, really miss is I, I tracked down and never heard before interview with Stanley Kubrick, who brought out uh, Clockwork Orange that year. And I was desperate, you know, because this is really amazing to find that material. And, and I'm sure it doesn't happen very often. But this is part of the problem about getting that balance right that James mentioned earlier. You know, how long do you sit with one thing? Because you've got so many strands running. And in, in the end, the whole Clockwork Orange story wrapped up so beautifully with the rise of Ziggy Stardust and David Bowie, that going too deeply into the story of the making of Clockwork Orange would take us away from that. And so music is what kind of steered us. You know, are we too far away from music? How far can we go? And so we lost a lot of material because this essentially is an exceptionally interesting and innovative way of making a documentary, but it is a music documentary at the very heart of it. So we, we lost a lot of really excellent stuff because mm. of that. Did and you I, miss anything? Did you miss any any major? I mean, the other thing was 71 had so much great music in it. We were making it thinking, gosh, you know, 
if we miss so and so, will will you know like will it work? And I mean, a Asif was regularly asking us. I mean, we, you know, like we we all had lists of people. Like you know, have we thought about their story and are they going to be in or not? And you know, they're all the rights conversations and things like that. But but it was it was a constant thing of like, are we getting it? Are we getting the flavor of seventy one? Because there was simply so much amazing music that we were kind of you know you, you spoiled for choice. Well. Um... Whatever is there is amazing. Really <laughs> an astonishing piece of work. Um, I have a few more episodes to watch and I cannot wait. Um, and I'm, I'm sure it'll be well talked about and well received everywhere. So thank you very much for this informative, um, toe tapping, highly informative piece. And I wish you much, much success.